Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the first LVM meetup uh, happening here at uh, in Toronto in the IBM Canada Lab. Mm, this meetup is basically for getting to know people who are working on LLVM, so this is just an informal meetup. Feel free to hang out and talk to each other about different things that you're working on. And uh, in terms of social, this basic meetup is about anything that is related to LLVM, so that includes LLVM board and all the projects that are under the umbrella of LLVM. So, <laughs> we will be having uh, these uh, meetups happening frequently. So, uh, depending on how people would like to have it in terms of the frequency, we could have it monthly or quarterly. Um, so, it's, it's going to be a fairly recurring thing. Um, so, I guess people here um, have worked with LLVM. Is there anyone who has not worked with LLVM here? All right. And how many uh, of the folks here are uh, from the lab? Uh, all right. Okay, so we have quite quite a few people who are not from the lab. Um, was it easier to find uh, your way to the lab, or was it pretty hard? <laughs> pretty easy. Pretty easy. Okay, that's it. Yeah, because I remember the first time I was coming to the lab, uh, my GPS couldn't like get me to the lab, so I, I posted a picture with the the, the directions so that it's easier for people to get. There. All right. Cool. So um, I guess everybody knows Clang, uh, but just uh, just a quick intro to to Clang. Uh, it's basically a collection of uh, modular and reusable compiler and blue chip technologies. Uh, the project came about in 2000 uh, at the University of Illinois uh, under the direction of Vikram and Chris Leitner, um, and then it has gained traction from there. Now there are a lot of uh, projects happening in LLVM, and there are a lot of uh, Languages that have their uh, in LLVM and a lot of other projects. Um, we have uh, one speaker today. Today we'll be talking about the uh, loop optimizations in LLVM and the issues and solutions surrounding those uh, issues. So with that, I will call upon Michael Cruz to uh, talk about. It. Thank you everyone for coming. It's nice to see such a big audience for with elegant social. Usually the ones are oh, sorry. So now again, thank you everyone for coming. Such a liberty if you love people for elegant social. Um, first about me, so I'm Michael. Um, I'm before you ask, I'm, I'm German, studied my until my master's degree at the University of Paderborn in Germany, uh, then went on with a PhD in, in Paris, uh, made a postdoc there, uh, and now I'm working at the Argonne National Laboratory uh, in, in Chicago on compiler stuff like LLVM. So uh, today's talk is, um, is the sound okay? Uh, today's, oh sorry, go ahead. It works. Yes. Uh, today's talk is, some, uh, is based on uh, a talk I gave at the end of last year, the event developers meeting in, in San Jose. At that time I only had 20 minutes, so it's quite condensed, but quite a lot of, of slides. So since we have a lot more time here, I could like to have, an, if it's more like, uh, a bit more interactive, so um, please don't hesitate uh, to, to ask questions if something is unclear or, or you would like uh, to know more. I also would like to know more about you. So you already asked uh, using Clang. Who already uh, compiled something with Clang? Who knows what the difference between LLVM and Clang is? Maybe I should might ask uh, other questions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> who has already looked in the LLVM source code? Um, who here knows what a uh, parse manager is? Good understanding of Who here already has programmed their own parse in for LLVM? Okay, that's quite a lot. <laughs> so well, that means uh, I think if you know this, it becomes quite familiar. It goes quite in, into the internals. So 
Uh, I said it's it's based on on a talk in I gave at the end of Gelbergs meeting called Loop in Optimization in, in um, LLVM, the good, the, the bad and the ugly. So good things are what I think LLVM in terms of loop optimization does very well. And there's bad things which I think there would be room for, for improvement. And the ugly things where I think there are some some bigger problems that need some bigger hammer hammer to to solve. So, but first, ask your question: Why do we actually have loop optimizations in the compiler? So, we have different optim uh, approaches how to do loop transformation. They are not necessarily in, in the compiler. So, you have optimization in the compiler, which can either be like automatic, like something Poly does, trying to completely automatically optimize through a loop without user interaction. Or you can have based on the language, which has some semantics for, for loop optimizations. Uh, up to entirely new languages like uh, Chapel, Extend, which are more based on, on stuff that can, can be considered loops. You can also have something uh, that works before the compiler, that takes some source code and outputs some new source code, which can be uh, um, compiled by a regular compiler, which does more um, more higher level like transformation optimizations like uh, loop optimization. Another approach is you want to have your, your optimization captured in a library. That's something you can hand optimize your loop, get it into the library and link against it and then use the optimized loop. You have languages that based on C++ templates and do a lot, uh, lot there. Or uh, something even an embedded ISL. You give a string in a in a source language to the library. It compiles it and uh, just in time, and then runs it. Um, and there are the totally domain-specific lang uh, languages that are only meant to compile one basic thing. So, for instance, Kiral is for lattice QCD. That's something I I worked on during my PhD. Spiral or, or Lyft, which is a, a BLAS library or a, a BLAS domain specific language. But I think actually, whether you, whatever approach you, you prefer, I think actually the, the decision whether we want inside the core loop transformations in the compiler has already been made since um, we already have transformations in the compiler, for instance. Quite popular, you have this problem manual. So you uh, add a problem manual in front of your loop, and instead of um, writing the entire expanded loop by yourself, you can keep it more condensed like this. So I think that's a quite practical uh, advantage here to have some form of loop transformation inside uh, the compiler. Um, so Unroll is not the only one, as you see. So there's a little big collection of different such for loop optimization, different compilers support. Unfortunately, they are all different. So depending on whether you're playing or use GCC, you need some different syntax uh, there. Uh, for instance, so a lot of compilers support Uh In the recent in GCC. GCC also actually added such a problem by insist of a render prefix. So if you want to unroll your loop, you have to prefix it with GCC. So you can't compile the same code and uh, with uh, with different compilers. You have one version for each of the compiler. Actually, this is the reason why here at the same time this week there's an uh, OpenMPD uh, language committing meeting, and one of the things I tried. To do to get uh, these things, some of these things <coughs> with Prime on P, on P and have, for instance, have a Prime on P and what yet. So let's go to, to LLVM. So, first thing, what I think is well, we've got in, in LLVM. So, what we have, we have quite a lot of collection of passes in LLVM which do loop transformation. So, loop unroll, I already mentioned. But also loop unswitching, loop interchange, uh, loop IDM recognition, um, uh, loop deletion, loop distribution, loop vectorization, loop fusion, just recently added, um, software pipelining, and all these are quite modular. So they are 
independent of each other, you can apply one transformation independently of whether you apply another uh, optimization, you can switch them, them on and off as, as you like. So, and uh, they were already in a very good return, the uh, part that uh, that clean supports. So you may have noticed there are quite a lot of transformation, but there are not partners for all of that. At least we have some, we have some loop vectorization, loop distribution, uh, loop pipelining, and loop unroll, um, including unroll and, and gem. So another thing, so more into the internal. So how does this thing internally? How is a loop represented in, in a Debian? It's a um, it's a in the type of a control flow graph, and there is a, uh, a normalization or a standard format present in the LLB. Yeah. So if you have CFG, and there's a pass called uh, loop rotate, which ensures that more or less the uh, the, uh, the control flow graph of um, of a loop has this form. So this is a loop with the back edge, so it uh, iterates over from header. To exiting to latch, and you can identify the uh, loop by its header. In the literature, usually a uh, loop is identified by the package instead of the header. You have a pre-header, which is useful if you want to uh, move code from inside the loop before the loop. You put them into the pre-header, and you have a guard. So guard can protect them if we have a, can have a check whether we need to execute the loop at all, and if not, we jump directly to the, the, the exit node. So this has been an element for a long time, and it's, uh, it's a relatively robust. Yeah, please. I think that it's part of the canonical form. It doesn't have a dedicated exit. Um, this is an example. I don't want to make it too complex. <laughs> this is not canonical. This will not compile. Uh, I can construct the, the control flow graph file. <laughs> okay, so there's some some infrastructure based on this. So uh, first, there's an analysis passes passes loop info. The loop info um, uh, detects uh, loops in in there, not necessarily in this form below. But this is transformed in, inside a loop uh, using a loop rotate pass. There is also a pass called uh, Scala Evolution. You may have heard of it. I think it's uh, maybe the, the jewel in there. So there's, it does a lot of stuff in there. For instance, if you compute, um, have a loop from i to n, and uh, compute the, the sum of all i's in there, it will transform it to a, a quadratic uh, closed form expression, so which is um, the, the n times n minus 1 divided by 2, Bell's formula, and will replace this, the i that you use after the, the, the result by this expression. So quite a good form, uh, formula. In, in the dev meeting, the, some, when I said it's Quite a well um, uh, passed there. And I heard a hard laughter in the audience, <laughs> but I later found out that it's actually was just an um, accident. Someone behind the door was maybe telling a joke. I don't know. <laughs> so there are some other ones. In, uh, in addition to loop rotate, there's uh, another pass called loop simplifier, which does some simplification. For instance, if you can split if if there is uh, there are two loops which have the same header, it will try to put them apart to have two different headers for, for each of the loops. That's an induction variable simplification pass and the loop closed uh, single static assignment form. So it creates this uh, this normalized loop closed SSA form. Uh, there's its transformation loop versioning which you can use to copy code and just transform one of the passes. Um, we'll come back to that. So that's the thing I uh, I find good. Unfortunately, the bad little thing is longer, although it might be just petty things. So that's no surprise it's longer. So first, to, for the overview, how does the, the pass pipeline work that I asked about for those who don't know? So you have the source one, 
which goes to the front end, and this, uh, uh, this takes claim, goes through uh, some return passes, and has an LLVM generation. So this is a pass to LLVM into the pass manager, and you have looked some, some passes running through there, some kind of optimization passes, loop optimization passes, I have poly in there as well, if it's optional, you can have it or not. Uh, the loop vector is passed, then more optimization passes, and at the back end you have a translation in another representation called machine IR, which is eventually uh, formed into the assembly. So, uh, a lot of things that I'm going to tell you has to do with this form. So, uh, here in the same thing, actually in, in more detail, so in here we have the, uh, the code generation part and uh, the sequence of loop transformation as they actually are inside um, LLVM. So you may have seen someone say, oh, well, these are disabled. So you may consider them there as experimental. You have to do additional work actually to, um, to make them do something. They're not enabled by default. So, um, uh, the ones enabled are like loop unswitching, loop deletion, unwarming, loop vector translation, something loop load uh, um, elimination. But a lot of them are actually, you don't get them by default. Uh, that's not that issue. So, the, with this structure in the past, it also means that the order in which you apply transformation is fixed and, and cannot change that, that easily. So, for instance, the, if using OpenMP, the parallelization will take place in, in the front end. And you can't do first the transformation and afterwards the transformation. Because if you, for instance, hit the loop interchange, it's added by default, um, and want to parallelize afterwards, you, you can't. It just does not apply to the order there and there in the. Uh, in, in the pipeline. So, uh, as I said, I, I'm working on, on trying to change this in OpenMP, so you can have, have OpenMP quad marks which tell you in which order you want to do the, the transformations, and we need to change some the somewhat into the, the uh, in the pass manager to actually allow this instead of the <coughs> fixed order of, uh, of loop transformations. So, one of the, since one of the results is um, the, the order in which you apply them actually matters also, in, like in this example, it matters whether you first do a loop reversal or first do an unrolling, you get different code if you apply them successively. So it's yeah, you, you, what is different, and when, when you want to have a, one specific result, you would rather have this one as, as this one. You need to choose a, a, a different order. So, another thing is, so you have loop passes, but these are actually not the only passes in the pass pipeline. So, the passes in between those loop passes, uh, like loop unswitching, um, LCSS, on. There are actually other passes scattered in between. And those don't necessarily know about this loop canonical form. So they may actually destroy it. I give an example here. So loop simplify uh, may remove loop headers. And I said this, this is kind of a bummer since LLVM identifies loops by its header. And then it's removed, this effectively removes the loop in the loop representation. So you wouldn't need to renormalize it again uh, to get your your back. And I think, but this has I think fixed since then. Uh, uh, I'm not sure whether it's fixed completely. There are a lot of these small issues in there. Another one is jump threading, which I think has only been partially um, uh, fixed. Uh, jump threading tries to skip. Um, uh, Basic blocks, if it can. So, if you go to this loop normal form, what uh, uh, jump threading would do actually, if it can, it would jump from the header directly to the exit. So, 
this means that we have multiple exiting action edges and some other analysis passes, specifically scalar evolution, evolution does not really know to handle it. So you can, after this jump threading, suddenly you can't apply the transformation you want because uh, the analysis, analysis based, it is based on it doesn't work anymore. So, yeah, this part has been partially fixed. I think it, the fix is not com complete. There are more complex things like ins combine also in between tries to change um, uh, arithmetic instruction to bit instructions. For instance, you multiply by two, it converts to bit shift to left. This makes the uh, things that rely on arithmetic logic like a uh, number of um, uh, loop iterations more complex. Suddenly you need to know uh, need to know that bit shift by one to the left is equivalent uh, to uh, multiplication by two. Possible, but make and incorporating to scalar evolution, but can make this somewhat more more complicated. So another one is if you have this loop passes, you have this loop analysis, you know, like loop info. And we have other passes in between which do not know about loop info uh, and invalidate this information. Um, what it means, it's not the end of the world. You need to uh, rediscover the loops after this pass, which do not know about loops. Um, this, yeah, totally possible, in, uh, not in Bama, but uh, you do an analysis twice that you could maybe avoid if you would uh, have preserved this information what loops you have. So, uh, there are also Scala transformations between that make the, the uh, loop optimizations harder. So I gave an example, uh, next there's a loop in the code motion pass, there's global value numbering and, and closed SSA. Is for loops, makes some loop transformations easier, but others harder. So, give an example here. Yeah. So, if you see only the two both loops at the tops, so this is a uh, nest perfectly nested loop and this is a perfectly nested loop. So, you could apply a uh, transformation to convert between each other. Uh, and uh, from the right to the left or from the left on, on the right. So, loop to interchange could do, uh, can do both directions. And you can determine by some logic saying actually uh, to determine which of the two representations actually the better one. But once you have this scalar kind of optimization, so for instance on the, um, on the left you have the loop invent code motion pass, which also happens to do register promotion and you would get the equivalent of this. So this one is not a, um, a perfect loop nest anymore. Obviously so it's something uh, along the innermost loop and you can't apply the loop interchange anymore. On the other side, if you started with this representation, you did a GVN, so GVN is global value numbering, and it also happens to do a load um, partial redundancy elimination. And if you do that, you get to this representation, um, uh, uh, moving out the, the load of the element of B, before the numbers loop, and again, you can't apply the loop interchange that easily anymore. So basically, if you want to go from here to here, you have to undo the, the partial redundancy elimination, uh, do the loop interchange, and then you can do it with a, the bridges type promotion again. Yeah, so, so Michael, so it sounds like that uh, uh, there isn't the concept of a, of a loop nest even in LLVM. So there, there's, the, the all, nearly all the transformation is shown is uh, on, on innermost loop. So this is like the units that LLVM passes like to transform and right. the, but that care about loop nest at all is relatively new. Like, yeah, so I guess loop interchange is not enabled by default. And yes, that's why yes, that was uh, with my loop interchange. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's disabled. Okay, more questions? No. So, another one. I talked about the loop plus SSA, which I think said 
good for some uh, uh, loop parsers, but bad for others. Especially if you have um, parsers which again work on, on loopness, something like loop interchange or, or tiling, which are a lot easier if you do that on perfect nested loops. So the loop SSA would actually um, insert a file instruction in between the, the inner and the outer loop. So I represented the CNC, so you would get a, a sum, and then would put the, the loop close SSA value for the loop of, uh, for the J loop. Uh, this is a self, uh, has a um, uh, loop close SSA, and it has a file node afterwards, and only at the end you use it. So instead of having uh, a dependency directly from Single dependency from this sum to give the use of it, you would have a chain of dependencies. Which, and especially this is not um, that obviously perfectly nested anymore, making the interchange or tiling somewhat harder. So, good for some loop optimization, especially for the innermost loop again, because nothing changed in the innermost loop, but for the outer uh, loop, it, it may make it. Another one we just talked with some folks here about this uh, this afternoon is this loop gun thing. So this loop rotated form would transform this to this. So we have had checked first the loop guard whether the, we need to execute the loop at all. And if you know it's executed at least once, so we don't need to check again whether it's executed at least once we executed, just executed the first time, and only at the end check whether it needs to be executed in, uh, once more. So if we go from a perfectly nested loop again, we have an outer loop and an inner loop inside, the, inside we have the loop body, and with the loop guard suddenly we have a if condition uh, in there, which is, again, we could think about uh, how, uh, how to handle it with some special handling, but it definitely did not make it easier. So, uh, another one is you have select instructions and you have find instructions, uh, which in use case somewhat overlap. So you can, with a select instruction, you uh, assign a value, which can either be um, the value A or value of B, depending on what the value of C is. Can express this just as a control flow with a uh, with a, uh, a phi uh, node as well. You have a branch at the beginning, or depending on C, you jump to something, and at the end, depending on where you come, when you come from B, you take the value, uh, a smaller case B. If you are coming from A, you jump to A before you are taking the um, the the value uh, lowercase a to use for a while. So there are actually transformations which try to select one of them in, in between. So there's a simplified CFG. If it says something as trivial as here, it tries to convert it to that thing. That makes the control flow easier. But these are logically interchangeable. So uh, unfortunately, at uh, least for the transformation, this sets model of control flow, which may make your transformation a lot more difficult than this representation, but both exist. Um, yeah. So then we have come to the infrastructure. So I showed you the passes, one after the other. They also uh, they do use some common infrastructure, for instance, for dependence analysis. Unfortunately, as you can just see here, there's not just one dependence analysis, there are uh, multiple of them. And each uh, the, the actually transformation passes use a different one. For instance, the, the loop vectorize uses the loop access info. Others, like loop interchange, uses the dependence info um, infrastructure. So, and there are a couple, uh, couple of more loop interchange also uses uh, loop interchange legality, which is based on dependence info. It's a bit of redundancy and some of them are not used that much, which makes it easy to that there are bugs sneaking in them because they are used so, so few, especially like loop interchanges, not just by default. 
if something is breaking in there, it can take quite a while until someone notices because most users don't use it. Uh, then, uh, how to define, determine whether some transformation is, is profitable, whether it actually makes a program faster than it was before? Good question. So, we have the loop interchange profitability as an incentive for loop interchange. Uh, we have something for loop vectorized, we have a, for unrolling and unrolled boost analyzer, but the rest of it basically do not use any profitability uh, uh, model. So meaning they do not know whether they are themselves, whether they are profitable, and you have to tell them manually, for instance, by a or you have a command line switch to do this transformation, therefore. Um, at least for code transformation, you have the loop versioning, which is shared by multiple passes, and you only have one of them. Yes. Yeah. So, how to write a new loop pass? Um, this can be quite a long... Uh, it's, it's not that easy, so you have a lot of boilerplate there, you need to get your dependency and so on, you need to all manually as a result. Uh, your loop passes <coughs> have 1,000 and plus lines, each of them. So writing a new pass, less one is no tiling pass. And uh, you can expect, if you write a new pass, which does tiling, you will need at least 1,000 lines um, to do it. Uh, you also have to handle the low-level complexity as a high-level transformation you would like to not care about. So if you have you have to ensure that the control flow is right, because when dominance information, you have to prefer the, the uh, static single assignment for, for everything manually, and you have to preserve passes. So if you change the control flow, you have to uh, preserve the, the analysis that depend on it. Uh, for instance, the, the loop info, if you create a new loop or delete a new, New lo uh, loop inside the control flow graph, your function, you actually have to tell the loop info about it, or, or the dominator tree, or Scala evolution. Otherwise, they assume the code has not changed, and uh, the path that uses it after you will get wrong information. So, so in, in, in con just to show you that it can be easier than in 1000 lines. This is what I'm doing using, using Poly. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm developer on, on Poly, uh, which has an internal representation called called um, a schedule tree, uh, where you present such a loop nest like this. So we have a boot node called the main node. Uh, you have a node representing loops, which is called the band, and then you have a sequence. Sequence executes one after the other. So this is uh, we present this loop, we have a loop over i, and inside this loop we execute a statement a and a statement b. And we can do a loop distribution by just exchanging the roles of the, um, um, the, roles of the, the uh, band, the loop node, and the sequence node. So if we put the sequence node of the um, the loop node, we get this graph which represents this code. And if we have a, a code that can we transform the schedule tree again back to the code. Um, so, this transformation on a tree is a lot easier. So, this is the entire code of it. Um, so, the transformation itself is this one. This is some, some board update. This is a legality check whether you can actually do this, and if it's successful, it returns a new loop, which is then passed to uh, the code generator. So this, it's a bit of a comparison apples to oranges because the the uh, the passes I mentioned before do some more than just that, but still I think it's a bit of an impressive um, difference. There are smaller things. Um, Need to be fixed. So, for instance, you have uh, this induction uh, variable simplify pass. And one of the things it does is it normalizes the the uh, bit length of the um, induction variable to the native size of your platform. 
so most of the time 64 bits. Um, this, uh, if you have another induction variable with 32 bits, then they cannot be merged by GBN, for instance, and you end up with uh, two induction variables, one in 64 bits and one in 32 bits, which is redundant. You have the, the Scala evolution expander, which gives you the uh, takes each Scala evolution expression and gives you back the LVM IR that represents it. Uh, it tries very hard to get a strength reduced representation of everything, but every time you use something strength reduced, uh, you use one more register. And it does not look into how many registers you actually have available. So it increases your register pressure and you need more spelling. Um, there is another one that has a concept like loop IDs. Um, actually, I worked on it and already committed this patch men, uh, mentioned here. The issue was that you have a loop ID, but it was not identifying a loop because it was neither unique to one loop. You could have the same loop ID for multiple loops. Um, uh, yeah, nor, nor you would have to need the loop ID. So it's totally, it, you, the loop ID is not persistent, so it could change after transformation. After some transformation, you have a loop and have a different loop ID after that. So it's totally unsuitable to identify a, a, a loop. I, I removed this kind, it's still called loop ID, but it's not meant to be identifying the loop anymore. A small thing, there's a machine pipeliner. Um, if you see this pragma uh, to do pipelining, it's uh, use, usually you get a warning if you write such a pragma, but the compiler does not apply this transformation for various reasons. Uh, but not for the machine pipeliner because it's after the pass that was warn you about this not a factor. So first this part questions here. No? Okay. So think that I think is these might be petty things, can be fixed, could change this uh, 64-bit induction value a variable. Just needs someone to work on it. So now the thing, bigger things. So we have the issue that every single of these optimization passes determines whether it's profitable only by itself. So um, let's say we have the loop distribution, and loop distribution could enable some other transformation, for instance, vectorization. But the loop distribution does not know whether the the result will be vectorized or not. So in the case of LMVM, it just doesn't do it. Um, it. But it would be nice if this could be have a common profitability model. You would have, if the loop distribution could actually tell whether one of the results can be, of the loop distribution can be vectorized, parallelized, uh, whatever, only then apply the loop distribution. But since these um, our loop optimization passes are quite separate, there is no shared model. So uh, in case for instance in Angular and Jam, there's some relatively complicated loop uh, logic uh, that determines whether you want to apply unroll or unroll in Jam. Um, yeah, and I think with the current structure to have one pass, one transformation, you can ultimately not solve this. These are will be always independent um, or implement their own profitability. Um, this is how the pass structure is, is built up. Yeah. What do you mean by force? Um, force is this part my you add to the uh, to this loop. So we have pragma. So the question is what force is. Um, uh, the first is if you add a problem in the source code, um, it adds an, an so called metadata to the loop, which tells them to unroll. This un, uh, inside the, 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 the uh, pass, it's understood as the force attribute. Force is unrolling, otherwise, it would try to find out heuristically whether it's profitable to do unrolling and by how many. Uh, by 
how, how often to unroll. So fonts just unroll, doesn't matter uh, whether that's profitable or not, that's in the control of the user. So the uh, next thing is, so there's a code version. And code versioning is um, some part of the infrastructure, but again, it's, it's involved independently for each of the optimization classes. At the moment, we have um, four optimization classes. I don't know, does Fuse also do loop versioning? Okay. Um, but it could do. The moment is these uh, four classes doing loop versioning, and it applies loop versioning after one another. So, like, loop versioning would apply loop versioning, uh, would duplicate the loop and optimize one of them. Loop distribute would uh, then try to loop distribute the original loop and the optimized loop. So, and since uh, loop distribute does loop versioning again, it may again uh, make two copies of each of them. So, you get the power of up to 16 copies of the same code. So, a bit of a code flow, just to illustrate that we start with a loop, this time nested loops, which makes it even worse. So, we apply transformation on this loop, so loop versioning. So, let's say we transform this one in some way, code motion or whatever, and did not transform the other one. And the one time condition says whether it's valid to execute this one. For instance, one time condition can be whether there's some aliasing or going. Going on or not. So if there's some aliasing, we have to go to fallback. Some pointers point to the same address. Don't know what happens if they we now do not point to the same address. We can optimize the loop. So we apply another optimization. Let's say we have the second one. So this time we I applied some some strip mining. We created a new loop, which will again be loop versioning in the next step, and we do the same for the fallback loop. We apply the next transformation, and I'm not going through that, and leave the fourth one for you as homework. <laughs> so this is this is again a result from uh, ha uh, being the passes being separate. The loops passes do not know whether loop version has happened in the passes before. Uh, it's not just because the transformation was different. Sometimes it's because dependence analysis. Alias analysis are very weak in LDN, and that forced people to version because they cannot prove uh, the you know there is no aliasing or there is no dependencies in the loop. A compile time, which is totally provable in many cases, uh, you know, a lot of this versioning happened because of those weaknesses, not necessarily because you know you don't you you need to tie the transformation one one with it, with the other. I, I, here's the worst case, so I assume every time in versioning. Um, it, it would be a good thing if we know in some cases we do not need versioning, because we know you can actually mark your pointers to be restricted, tell the compiler uh, these pointers do not alias. They're pointing to a different location. In this case, the, we would not need to do, uh, use uh, uh, some one-time condition, but in the worst case, I would assume we do need it. So these are common. Often, like if you um, if you start to have a, a value with um, int min, something you cannot take the absolute on. Yeah, yeah. You have to assume yes. Okay, we in, if it's min in, we execute some other code. Then in the uh, I agree cases. that there are cases in which version is necessary because the condition is already a runtime condition. What I'm saying is that there are many cases that are the end, and that's the ugly, uh, where the condition can be known at compound time by doing better dependence analysis or better radius analysis. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, so that in many cases, versioning, would, in many practical cases, versioning would not be too much of an issue, or much less of an issue than it is right now. Mm -hmm. So, do you have seen this case where it could be? Yeah, we can always improve the compiler. <laughs> more, most con more, even more concerned about the thing, things where you cannot avoid it because the source code semantic. We have to preserve the source code semantics and have, uh, 
And if it's just because some value might be in the min, if you cannot really apply a transformation that might be a dharma, and in practice your value probably won't be in the min. Um, but we still want to optimize it, and for this case, we do loop chain. So if, if we can know it, we can improve the analysis, right? But we can't, unfortunately, can't do it in, in the general case. So, uh, more questions? Yeah, just one thing. Uh, so when you have a question, could you just raise your hand and uh, somebody with the mic would come to you, so um, uh, you could um, uh, ask your question on the mic. Thank you. Okay, let's go to the next part. So, MLIR. Who has heard from about MLIR yet? Okay, so this for those who know, MLIR was presented or uh, introduced by the last, uh, last ULVM developers meeting in, in Brussels, um, which is uh, Chris Mutler. So he uh, uh, works now at, at Google, works on machine um, artificial intelligence optimization. So, and he presented at the last year by LLVM a new intermediate representation um, called MLIR. MLIR didn't specify what it stands for, it could be machine learning intermediate representation, could be multi level uh, intermediate representation, could be maybe a recursive acronym. Uh, NLIR language intermediate representation. So it's purposefully uh, unspecified. So um, said so, so he was hired by, by Google, mostly of optimized uh, <coughs> machine learning, and one of the things we wanted to do is fix of fix some of the design issues in, in LLVM. Uh, the examples, so at the moment LLVM has something called ins combined, which is a lot of handwritten code for pattern matching, and instead of handwritten code, they have a generator to generate this, this pattern matching. So, one, one improvement. We could also ultimately uh, introduce it in LLVM. Uh, I have heard a lot of people talking about it, but has not happened yet in, in LLVM. And then also some polyhedral techniques, something that Poly does in, inside it. MLIR, they are called a fine something, a fine loop. Uh, I use it for, for uh, dependency analysis and some out of bound warnings. So, how it looks like, so useful features. First, it provides some dialects. Um, so, it does not have a fixed set of operations, but these are imported from a so called dialect. There's a dialect, for instance, for LL, VMIR. Which represent the operations you can do in LLVM IR. But you have other uh, operations as well, for instance, for, for TensorFlow, where this uh, project originates from. And you can actually mix them inside the same, uh, same file. Some files, things from LLVM IR, some things from TensorFlow, Flow, and some, some else. Um, in contrast to LLVM, it actually has multi dimensional. Uh, memory for references, so you have here a uh, load. Instead of just having one address like LLVM does, it um, has a multi-dimensional index. This uh, would be useful if you come from a front-end language which actually has a representation of multi-dimensional indexes. C, C++ do not have, but it could be useful for something like Fortran, or in this case, TensorFlow. Uh, and another thing, it has first-class closures, uh, which is represented here. Actually, the loop is represented as a closure. So we have this operation, this fi 4 saying here's a loop from 0 to n, and execute this one inside the end. And what it passes as an argument is the closure of the code to, to execute. Um, so this is as an alternative to uh, the control flow graph. So at the the keynote given at the Brussels Europe LLVM, um, he uh, proposed some dialect for an intermediate representation for Clang. So the, the idea is maybe instead of directly generating LLVM for Clang, first go to uh, to MLIR 
and uh, do some optimization on this a bit higher level representation, and we go down from NLIR to LLVM afterwards. So in, in, this is an example from the slides, what one might do. So we, you have this compound P parallel form, and you would have an operation uh, or P parallel form, which takes the new body uh, as input, takes some arguments and executes this this in parallel. So um, once for the telex, it's uh, I'm not sure. So there is some advantage if you want to um, do it some link <coughs> outlining. So at the moment you have the front end inserts the the calls to the OpenMP one time in the front end. So that means that the the um, um, that the uh, editing itself for its passes is a bit more restricted to um, whether to uh, how to optimize these like loop fusion. All it sees is a one-time call. Uh, however, something that Johan is working on, you can actually tell the compiler this is a one-time call which takes uh, another function and and apply some optimizations on it. So in effect, the difference is only that okay, a syntactic one. Uh, instead of having uh, passing a pointer to the function that you are parallelized to a one-time function, you have this inside syntactically inside um, uh, inside the uh, intermediate representation. So uh, next thing, uh, as a solution that I I would propose. I, how I would uh, improve the loop optimizations in LLVM, which is a change of representation, which I call a loop hybrid heat graph. So the first thing is idea, we don't have different passes, we have just one pass. In that case, we can assume, we know there are no Scala passes in between which can mess with our representation, which is the source of one, some of the problems we, we had before. And the, the loop optimization pass would uh, uh, would do everything that is loop optimization uh, related. There's some precedents in that one, like some other passes to that. There's this V plan thing in LLVM for which is used by the loop vectorizer, which is an alternative representation of LLVM IR. There's some group, uh, transformation on it, and then generates LLVM IR from it again. Or actually, the machine pass manager is itself um, uh, a pass which takes the LLVM IR from the main pass manager and then converts it to machine intermediate representation. So we can do the same with another representation for loops as well, not just, not just for vector things and machine IR. So yes, so one another problem that we had was. The heuristics, whether we determine whether some transformation is useful, was distinct. Uh, if you have an alternate representation, especially here, we can have these captured in some function. And then you, my idea here is we would go from very specific transformation. Let's say, okay, we apply a problem that has obviously precedence before we do anything heuristically. Or we detect a matrix matching multiplication and con convert it into a plus function and so on. And if none of these above match, we go to the more general op optimization up to the very more uh, lower level ones. So this was then just not possible in the, uh, the, uh, um, in the current edit. Uh, yeah, question? So, I mean, do you envision some of the analysis we talked about loop distribution before that currently only cares about exposing vectorization opportunity, for example? Yes. Uh, but it may not care about uh, catch reviews. Yeah. And so it doesn't, it is not aware. So <laughs> it, it only does, it only has one heuristic. Um, so, do you envision having something like, uh, you know, for example, for loop distribution or other optimization, having a more sophisticated analysis will tell you, which tells you I should distribute this loop for this target target 
uh, you know, vectorize this because I know that for that architecture is good to vectorize, or you know, I should probably do, you know, I should I should distribute in another way to create a perfect nest or or other type of heuristic. Or do you envision to create a package where you're gonna run simple things like this? Um, if I have a high level opportunity, then fire off the transformation, otherwise fire off like connect the loop passes in a certain order within your your optimization package. Sure. Yes, uh, both of them. So this is very simple. Really? Okay. Um, uh, yeah, both of this. This is what I think is sh should be what what you would capture as common uh, as common knowledge. You know stuff that okay. You know I see matrix matrix multiplication. You know how to optimize it. So you can capture it in, in this thing. If you do a, a, a matrix multiplication, you can either, okay, in this case, simple call, make link to a BLAST library, which is recompiled and optimized by your architecture, which probably gives you the best performance you ever get. If you do not have a BLAST library, you could do some uh, alternative thing. Um, in, in explicitly this example, matrix multiplication, there's whole lot of literature about how to optimize it. So uh, one thing, and this can be encoded here. So I, I kept it here, just the call to uh, libplus. But you could also do the optimization that the, is hand-coded in the plus virus, which is actually uh, tiling on multiple levels, which is loop interchange, uh, some optimization called <coughs> game picking. Um, and uh, vectorization on two dimensions. Uh, you could encode this here. Uh, another one's example, not here, is you detect a stencil. Stencil have lots of form. And there are then lots, you can't encode just all the stencils in the library, it just stencils are too, too flexible. So, but you know quite well how to optimize stencil. There's also again lots of literature about how to optimize stencil and you can code what to do on the stencil right here. Um, these are quite high level stuff, but if you go, go down, it says if it's parallelizable or parallelizable after uh, distribution or something, you can code, code it here. The other part I want is a um, idea, the second is a cost heuristic model. You apply the transformation, uh, pass the result to a cost model, and it gives you a score of how good this thing might perform. And then from a set of, of uh, variants, you choose the one which is the fastest. You could do that. But this, this latter one you probably don't want in, in... It may increase the compile time, since you evaluate multiple choices and you have to create copies. For the choices may take more more time, but if you like me coming from an HPC context, it might be worth it. If you take have your code is one person smaller, it may save you a, a week on execution time on your expensive uh, supercomputer. Yeah. So you mentioned that one of the advantages of this approach is that um, you no longer need to you no longer have the scalar. Uh, passes in between that can uh, do detrimental things to your code. Yeah. Uh, but aren't there also the opposite problems where you might want to do some scalar optimization after you've done certain loop optimizations to clean up or you know improve the code and then move on to next steps? Yes, I want, but probably not those in in LLVM. So there, there are the ones that are currently implemented. I'll give you the example. Um, there's um, LLVM parsers will try to get stuff out of a loop. So if it's something loop invariant, it puts it in, in, in front of the loop. Since if it's in front of the loop, it's not executed repeatedly just once. That's obviously beneficial. But for the purpose of analogous uh, loop transformation, that in um, Adds dependencies to uh, to uh, to the instructions. So suddenly you have a dependency from before the loop inside the loop, which you did not have before, and you can't apply all the transformations anymore. So this would 
the transformation you would want here is the exact opposite. You would move uh, instructions from before the loop inside the loop if it reduces the number of dependencies you have there. And then you kind of rely on the LLVM path of undoing this again. If you could move it inside the loop, then the LLVM path should be a, uh, able to move it out of it again. Right, but you could also conceive some, um, or think about cases where you might be generating code as you're uh, optimizing, and then you might need to do a passive GVN or CSE or dead code yes. in order to uh, get rid of it. That's, yes, I agree. I think that what, I think what they are trying to say is that there is no knowledge in many of these uh, scale optimization about loop or loop nest and so things that they do think to, to a loop too early before uh, a loop optimizer is able to you know take advantage of the original loop structure so in a way you could have a set of uh, um, scale optimization that run early but they are aware of the loop structure of a loop nest structure mm -hmm. and they try to preserve it and then they can go wild after the loop optimizer has done this thing, like the people change or distribution or whatever it is to do, and then do some set of late passes that they, they no longer need to be aware about the loop optimizer. This, this is kind of already the case. I've seen you the problem with the simplify CFG, which destroys some of the restructure. There's actually in the past called loop simplify CFG, which is supposed to uh, uh, keep the loop structure. Um, it's unfortunately not, not used to that extent, uh, so it, it's still the errors sneak in. Uh, maybe also, it, it, it would be great, for instance, if uh, the LLVM passes would have a clear structure first to the normalization slash uh, uh, canonicalization for loop passes, then do the higher level stuff, and then do the lower level stuff. Unfortunately, this is not the case in, in LFM. You have, for instance, the ins combined thing. It's not the case now. So it's not the case now. Yes. Yeah, but you you won't be able to convince the uh, the compiler. So the let's say the the code path as you have here is um, uh, quite like optimized. A lot of people have looked at it and found this serves their purpose. If you want to change it, you will have to argue a lot in the LLVM community um, that it's worth it. So, I, I get their point. Um, so, I get their point, and you're right. A lot of people have optimized that, and they like the way it is, and all of that, and you have to argue out the way. But the thing is, there's only that many loop optimizations, and some of which you've shown that are not even enabled are fairly new. So we optimize without having loop optimizations. Now, if we get loop optimizations, the whole optimize process will start new, and then people will actually have an argument to do something different. Um, I don't know where it, how it will play out, but we actually need these optimizations in a decent shape to be able to make the argument that we have to change something. Mm -hmm. And that is obviously it's a chicken egg problem. We want to like, integrate them to, to use them to improve them. At the same time, we have to get them into a shape that shows that we should integrate them to do them. But who is that being good? Please be bad. Don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. <laughs> 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 but I will say, that there exist compilers in, that were produced commercially that addressed this problem and came up with a different along the lines of uh, the suggestion down here. Do the high level stuff first and do the classic lower level stuff later because their visibility is pointer green than the loop. And you're perfectly right. If you do the wrong thing first, you destroy everything. So, it's no argument to say, well, this is the way LLVM does it, and 
It's the best, right? I didn't try to do that. I didn't no. even try to do that. I think that he was talking about the Apple, so I don't think that he advocates that this is the best way to do it. Yeah. I, I would not go, and if this was the only problem, I would indeed work towards that one. Unfortunately, we have the other problems as well. Yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, I think that Jonas is. It is true, there isn't that many loop passes in LLVM. A lot of them are not enabled by default. Yeah, so but I would like more. As we realize the need, especially for HPC code, to add more loop passes and, and you know, that the pipeline will need to be reworked to accommodate, um, you know, a, a stronger loop optimizer without necessarily breaking too much the code that works well today. And like people said, there are ways to do this, uh, and it's not just at the end. Many, many, many vendors have done this in the past, so it's not a problem. The reason why it's not been solved before. It is an interesting problem. So, the, one of the reasons uh, a lot of people didn't pay enough attention on the loop transformation in the current LVM trunk is every vendor has their own high performing loop transformer. We have been building one, IBM have been building one. For example, they don't, their implementation, they generate the LVMR, translate it to the W code, they do everything on the HMR, whatever, they do very fancy of it. There's no need for them to pay too much attention to this LVM transformation, right? We in Intel, we also do the same things. Then the question is how much effort we want to put into the community trunk to improve, to improve this. Uh, for example, one of the things you pointed out, this uh, cost model, the cost model actually is one of the critical things. You want to have a unified cost model instead of each loop transformation actually to their own cost model, right? At the end, a the lot of cost model is not precise anyway. But instead of a unified model, and also you have the query to your backend and the hardware code generation to get your hardware information to feedback to your cost model, you get a more precise cost model. All those stuff, so if you are relying on community to do that, without every wonder putting the actual effort, it's not going to work, as the John has already mentioned, right? The wonder has to put more effort to upstream your stuff to the LVM community trunk instead of doing their own high performing loop transformer. Yeah, I think there was a question at the back of the menu. Yeah. Uh, one question. So you were saying that detecting stencils while doing the matrix operations, did you mean detecting the pattern of the matrix? Uh, you were probably saying detecting stencils. Yes. So did you mean uh, detecting the pattern of the matrix? Like how the matrix is a filter? Uh, you were talking about matrix um, operations, yes. right? Yes. It's, yeah, that's, it's an excess pattern. So you you see um, that the you you have um, uh, the 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 excesses relative to uh, to each other. On the stencil, you have one stencil point and uh, some constant off for each value read a constant offset from there. Uh, so typically stencil pattern. And then you can apply knowledge, but, but if you have this excess pattern, you can apply knowledge from, from literature. Which is not just one transformation, it's a couple of them. So again, not something you could do with a single, or not that easy with a single uh, transformation. Okay, some more contribution? Okay, let's go on. So, uh, this is usually, I, I don't want to do this actually on the, the uh, LLVM IR, on, uh, with the, uh, um, that has the issues described before, but for on an alternative representation, which is uh, hierarchically in the loop. 
We already have the loop info, which constructs a hierarchy of loops on, on there. Basically, I want to extend them on, on that one, making this uh, the, the primary presentation we uh, apply loop transformations on instead of using this just as an analysis to uh, that, but it still refers to the LLVMIR, so we have to check the LLVMIR instead of the, uh, the loop tree. So, it looks like this one, since we are an example with, with one loop, which has a root node, this is actually the function, we have some loops in there, we have some statements, statements is something that can have static side effects and expressions, uh, which can be executed arbitrarily, speculatively, redundantly, whatever, whatever you like. Uh, if we do the transformation on this, actually we only have to cool create part of it. So in this case, I uh, reverse this loop. So instead of from going uh, uh, using the loop going up from S to 255, I count down from 255 uh, down to S. And this is a kind of assumes that um, S is not the, the smallest possible integer because then it, it, it's not included anymore. So, but from the original node, which do not change, we can just reference uh, back to the original one, which makes it kind of cheaper instead of needing to do a copy of the entire structure, we do a shadow copy of all the things that change, and because we have references to, to the uh, uh, root up to the root, we have a new function in, function in there. So, to, uh, but because we, we only have references to, to the children, we don't have uh, references of parent of a dog. Which makes some things more complicated. Sometimes we need this um, this link to the parent node inside the tree. So I took, took up an idea called a, a, a wet glue tree, which is ta actually taken from another compiler, a Wilson compiler, to more, make this more cheaply. So basically, uh, a wet glue tree consists of two trees. One is a green tree, and one is a uh, red tree. The green tree only has <coughs> links to the children. So we have from the root, uh, uh, from the root down to the children, but not up, up there, which is the representation which allows us the, the cheap copy. If we need a uh, link to the, the parent, we create another tree uh, on demand. So it's not created immediately, but only when you go to start to iterate with the tree. It's called the red tree, and this in contrast has links to to the parent. And in this case, it's a DAG, so in here it links to the same uh, child node. But when we create uh, the the red tree, we have a copy of it, so it existed twice here. Um, as as I mentioned already, if we can make a cheap comparison, uh, change the transformation. We replace this one by this one. We update the, the hierarchy, the green tree. We can reuse most of the node from the green tree. And then we can create, recreate the red tree on demand. Um, depending on how much we need, we create nodes on demand. So imagine the following. We want to apply a loop algorithm. This could be, property could be useful. So we have a loop and a loop body. Uh, a statement. If you try a loop unrolling, we could first naive one is we would just copy the, the body uh, four times. But using the such kind of representation, we actually can reuse the same body and uh, uh, instead link to the same node four times. And only actually when we have the red tree, we would get four different nodes, each representing the, uh, the copy of the unrolled uh, body here. Um, for, for, yeah. What's the question? For, for OpenMP, actually, we could, uh, it does not depend on how we represent the uh, OpenMP inside the LMVMIR, we could just uh, take 
what uh, ever invokes the dependent loop, uh, loop forward its body is and then insert this into the loop, hier uh, loop hierarchy graph. And you mark the loop as being parallel. And if you want to generate code that then or data, we can also start with a sequential uh, loop, mark one loop as a parallel, and emit open MP code again. So for analysis, we could only really use uh, multiple different analysis, so depending on what optimization level you have. So stuff like you could scale evolution. If you go on higher level one, you may also want to do a loop versioning. So in OS, when you're optimizing for size, you may not want to do loop versioning at, at all. Um, so predicated version is the one you need version of Scala evolution where you need new versioning before the analysis is, is started. Or if you go more expensive, you could do something like polyhedral value analysis. Uh, you could do an excessively uh, uh, excess analysis, determine what element you access, if you have one dim, uh, dimensional width or without dimensions, or using some uh, uh, multi-dimensional one doing another analysis step or delinearization to find the multi-dimensional structure of your base you are using. For dependency analysis, you could do something simple, which is maybe control flow uh, insensitive, you could do something sketch-based or go full-fledged polyhedral, either with an approximation or using an exact <coughs> solver, which may take more time in the compile time. Uh, but gives you you uh, may give you better results, which probably uh, uh, you trade um, um, uh, compile time to maybe get a faster uh, result. You may want to optimize just higher optimization level, like an example 022, 27, which does not exist yet. So, this dependency analysis gives you, can be, you different kind of dependencies. You have the standard beta dependency flow and your output. Uh, but also register dependencies, which is a, which you in standard LLVMR would call to use dev chain or a control dependency, uh, which says which uh, is a dependency saying whether some uh, code should be executed or not. Um, if you uh, also go a bit further to actually replace a control flow graph entirely by some predication. So instead of showing having control flow, so uh, having in a loop in the body you have some control flow, I would replace this uh, with predication. So uh, in this example, state R is executed unconditionally. So you have a condition saying whether that's executed is one. It's always executed. But after that, yes, a, a branch. And statement B is only executed when you're branching to this uh, this block from the thing, this branch. So the the condition uh, on that statement B is executed is uh, dependent on what branch in statement I you have taken. Same thing when you're in statement B, you decide whether statement C is executed. To say only a statement B goes to a specific, uh, to a specific successor, you are executing statement C. And actually, the last one is unconditional. Uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's always executed. Also, mentions uh, the thing that uh, you have two, you have uh, select instruction and finals, which kind of of can replace each other. This representation, you have just one, uh, one of them. You would select B, uh, depending on uh, which uh, successors has been taken. So in this case, whether which branch on um, statement A has been taken and which one statement B. This thing, of, for instance, can be simplified, which was not possible here. Uh, it's 42 in both cases. So it actually doesn't matter which branch statement B is taken and can replace it. Um, also, actually, you see what the, the, the branch that is taken from statement R, A, is actually the value of A. And you can do a replacement 
um, uh, replacement here replace every occurrence of the statement. And I have this control dependence on the value of this variable, uh, this register A. And it gets somewhat simpler here. Uh, so it's specifically all the dependency have gone in this example. So no more control dependency since A, let's say, is, is a parameter to a function or something. Um, no dependency. Here, for example, the sufficient condition is when it has, uh, uh, has to be executed, necessary to execute, when it can be executed. So, if possible, you can ex might be able to execute this speculative, speculative, uh, uh, speculative, uh, I can't pronounce it. <laughs> when, even when it's not strictly needed to avoid some branching. So I guess there are other, there are also other alternatives to build in memory a control dependence graph or a program dependence graph or a data dependence graph that are all known um, in memory representation of what you're talking about here. Yes. So I don't think this is the only. Uh, I do not know it's the only one. So that's the one that I'm proposing. Okay. So what do you think that this is better than the the, the alternative that I mentioned? Um, but this would require changing the IR, you know, the MIR quite substantially to a new, new type of blocks and, you know, uh, yes. well, the other one that I just mentioned, they, they are building memory on top of the existing IR representation. So I'm not sure if, um, if there are any advantages, so I guess what I'm asking is that, do you know of any advantages that this kind of representation would give you? as opposed to an in-memory representation of a, a PDG or CDG. One example is that you can have this cheap copy, for instance. So in, in kind of, this is a, this is an embedded con, uh, dependency graph. So I have the dependencies in here. So it is a different representation. I'm not, Depending on how you implement it, doesn't mean this is strictly better and, and, and alternative uh, representation. But I think it's easier to do loop transformations on this one. So just fewer code you need, uh, needed to implement a new transform, higher level transformation. Then and handling uh, for these low level issues with new uh, step chains and uh, repairing the um, uh, the dom uh, dominator tree and so on. Okay. So, uh, so when with these dependencies all done in this example, so we have replaced the uh, control dependencies with direct users on the, the variables they are computed from. We can reorder it. Without dependencies, so we assume obviously. I assume here that there's no requirement of ordering between statement A, statement B, statement C, and <coughs> statement B. And after you do some transformation, such as loop distribution, and suddenly I have uh, two loops. And if you look at this one, was not that obvious how to do this. Uh, whereas once you are here, and I think. You don't even need to consider control flow. This is embedded in the execution consider. Change the order of it according to what your cost model says, and then skip the loop. Uh, example, another thing you can do, loop versioning. So loop versioning has a function one loop, and you want to make uh, execute a different version of the same loop depending on some other condition. So you copy the loop, Execute one, depending when your um, one time condition is true, and uh, test another one if your one time condition is false. Uh, and both again link to the same body since they have the same loop. And after what the one where the one time condition applies, you know that transformation you is safe, you do the transformation. In this case, it's, uh, it's uh, strict minded. So after that, you've modified the loop, you can. Uh, Go, need to go back to the DMIR 
So since I don't want to implement another vectorization uh, it's already in view plan, but then we want to either produce LLVMIR as in here or produce a vectorization plan, which is then optimized by, uh, by LLVM's loop vectorize, and which then itself generates LLVMIR again. So the entire pipeline, what, what I've imagined, what we do, would create the, the graph from the IR, possibly lazily, so you know, don't want to spend uh, uh, compile time of things <coughs> you do not need at the end. Uh, you do some kind of localization. For instance, I said you move stuff inside the loop, uh, or the examples are replacing the control dependencies by, uh, by predicates uh, to make it more transformable. This does not matter at all, but well, that's not beneficial because we throw it away when we do not find something beneficial. We do the analysis on, on top of it, such finding dependencies and the loop items, such as uh, matrix matrix multiplication or, or stencils, and then we can go into the, uh, the transformation phase. So, depending on what we are doing, which where we decide what we do, so apply some quantum directive do some uh, optimization or do some uh, machine learning or uh, integer optimization. Uh, after that, after the transform, since we have sheep copy, we might end up with multiple uh, candidate uh, loop nests. So to make sheep copy, we might potentially produce multiple of them, like do the uh, distribution and see whether we can vectorize one of them. We apply the cost model of, uh, to it, which says which is the uh, fastest to execute, and choose that one to co generate at the end. So, we, uh, in the co generation phase, select the subtree we want to uh, generate. So, it will not be the entire function, just one subtree which actually changes, um, and if necessary, apply code versioning. Make a copy of the loop. So, difference here, there's in, uh, no matter how many transformations we do, it, you do at the end, uh, there will be just one fallback copy, just one here in created at phase six, uh, and then we do the actual code generation either to LLVMIR or the part we want to vectorize to to be planned. So finally, that's it. Last thing. And I want to note that I'm not the only first one who thought about this. There are some other um, frameworks which have kind of a hierarchical representation. Um, one of them is called the best optimization from the, the Open64 compiler. Um, it's more specific than to some transformations like tiling instead of being uh, very general like what I try to do. Uh, and the experience is relevant here to IBM. The XL Fortran compiled calls has a structure called uh, loop structure graph. Sounds quite similar in the framework called ASCII. ASCII stands for from analysis um, as a dog walker. Yeah, <laughs> something, something <laughs> like this. So, uh, People from IBM here should know about this, maybe. It's yes. in the podcast compiler. It's an old acronym that some people cannot say without spelling. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but I was, after I read it, I, uh, I found this one. I was surprised how similar these are. Well, my, my idea and this idea. Uh, but this came a lot earlier, I think late in the 80s or something. Uh, in in, in Fortran. <laughs> Sorry? No, 1990. Oh, okay. <laughs> and that's uh, ISL things that uh, in the thing that um, Poly uses, so the polyhedral optimizer in LLVM, called the schedule tree, which also has this um, hierarchical structure of, of rooms. <laughs> and I thank everyone for participating, and I'm open to more questions if you're not too tired yet. Thank <laughs> you.